But now let us proceed to the exposition of the esoteric and scientific exhortations. We will first consider those which, while giving information about the principal and primary essences, at the same time impel us to a theological and intellectual investigation and knowledge of these essences, and arouse us to acquire the highest type of wisdom. Archytas, accordingly, in the beginning of his treatise on wisdom, exhorts thus, Wisdom as much excels in all human affairs as the sight does the other corporeal senses, intellect the soul, and the sun the stars. For the sight is the most far-darting and most multiform of all the senses. Intellect is the supreme part of the soul, judging by reason and discursive knowledge what is right, and subsisting as the sight and power of the most honourable things. And the sun is the eye and soul of things which are in nature. For through it all things become visible, are generated and are apprehended. Moreover, deriving their roots and being generated from there, they are nourished, increased and excited by it in conjunction with sense. Here he shows very scientifically the nature and function of wisdom, and even more importantly, he then makes an exhortation to intellect and contemplation. Moreover, another good which is wonderfully effective of exhortation is supplied, for from those things which are familiar he deduces a reminder of higher unfamiliar natures through a clear analogy. For that sight is the most acute, subtle and excellent of all the senses is evident to all, nor is anyone ignorant of the fact that the sun is superior to the stars, and that intellect is the ruling principle of the soul, is assumed in even common conceptions on this subject. From these comparisons, then, he shows perspicuously and scientifically the preeminence of wisdom in relation to all human affairs, so that the truth becomes intelligible and comprehensible to those hearing arcane things in obscure speech. Moreover, from the differences of each, the knowledge of wisdom and the exhortation to it are learned. For, first, if the sight is the most far-darting and the most multiform of all the senses, so wisdom, analogously considered, apprehends the most remote things as present and comprehends within itself the forms of all beings. Second, if the intellect is the supreme part of the soul, judging by reason and discursive knowledge what is right and subsisting as the sight and power of the most honourable things, unquestionably wisdom similarly surpasses reason and discursive knowledge and contemplates beings by simpler conceptions than these, namely by intuitive intellections. It judges good things per se and perfects them in itself. It is the sight of intelligibles and subsists as the power of the most divine and perfect activities. And finally, if the sun is the eye and soul of natural things, for through it all things become visible, are generated and are apprehended, and deriving their roots and being generated from thence, are nourished, increased and excited by it in conjunction with sense. It is evident from these analogies that wisdom is the eye and life of intelligible things and supplies perception of intelligibles and being to all beings and is the primary cause of all production in the world and of the first generation and order. And so it is with us. Is there anyone who, wishing to participate in the highest felicity, will not pursue with great labour and alacrity such and so great a principle productive of so many goods? This, then, is the exhortation arising from the dignity and supreme supremacy of wisdom, that which is suggested by the nature of the true man, Architas shows in the following words. Man was generated by far the wisest of all terrestrial animals, for he is able to contemplate the things which exist, and to obtain from all things science and wisdom to which also it may be added that divinity has engraved and exhibited in him the system of universal reason, 
in which all the forms of things in existence are distributed and the signification of nouns and verbs. For a place is assigned for the sounds of the voice, namely the pharynx, the mouth and the nostrils. But as man was generated the instruments of the sounds through which nouns and verbs are signified, so likewise the conceptions which are expressed or represented by visible things. And this appears to me to be the work for the accomplishment of which man was generated and constituted, and received organs and powers from divinity. This mode of exhorting is assumed from the nature of man, for if man is the wisest of animals and able to contemplate the things which truly exist, it is necessary for him to strive for theological and contemplative wisdom, and if he has the power from nature of apprehending from all things science and prudence, he ought to acquire the demonstrative science and virtue of prudence as especially worthy and proper for him. In addition, since the divinity has engraved in him the system of universal reason, in which are all the forms of things and the significations of nouns and verbs, on account of these gifts it is right that he should apprehend the whole science of logic, since man is a spectator not only of these things which are signified by words, but also of the thoughts expressed in beings, and in order that he might do this work, he received from the deity instruments and powers. So on this account man should aim to acquire theoretic wisdom in the whole realm of being in so far as it is real being, and in all the species of things he should learn scientifically the principles and criteria of all knowledge. Moreover, he ought to view the intellect per se and the purest reason or thought, and notice how many principles from it are imparted to the beautiful and good things in human life. He should also be enthusiastic in inquiring all the virtues and the mathematical sciences and other arts or pursuits which we have discussed, and thus the exhortation based on the nature of man arouses us to the acquisition of the whole of philosophy. Architas also introduces another composite way leading to the same things exhorted in these words. Man was generated and constituted for the purpose of contemplating the reason of the whole of nature and of wisdom. Wherefore it is his duty to acquire and survey the intelligence of the things which truly exist. The composite referred to is this. With the peculiar nature of man, he mingled the common because these can act in harmony with each other. For if the theoretic reason of man is conversant with the reason of the whole of nature and the wisdom of man grasps and speculates upon the intelligence of the things which truly are, this being acknowledged, it is at once demonstrated that this reason is a part of universal reason and of the intellectual nature of the universe, and at the same time the exhortation becomes more perfect. For we do not live otherwise than in accordance with nature, which we all vehemently desire, unless we live in accordance with both human and divine reason. Nor will we become happy, unless by the aid of philosophy we acquire and contemplate the wisdom of truly existing beings. Moreover, another composite element in this exhortation may be noted. It simultaneously incites to both theoretical and practical philosophy, for the acquiring of wisdom is the work or function of an effective and practical kind of philosophy, whose end is not the mere consideration of a thing, but the apprehension of it by means of its activities. Contemplating, indeed, is the peculiar function of the theoretic intellect. To each of these, therefore, the exhortation pertains and rightly. But since the good of wisdom becomes more apparent when it becomes more common and extended to all things, so also a more perfect exhortation to it arises which Architas expresses thus. Wisdom is not conversant with a certain particular one of the things which are, but is absolutely conversant with all the things which truly exist. And it is requisite that it should not first investigate the principles of itself, but the common principles of all beings. For the relation of wisdom to all beings is the same as that of sight to all things visible, 
and it is the function of it to know and contemplate the universal qualities of all things. And on this account, wisdom discovers the principles of all beings. Here again, he does not confine or limit the energy of wisdom to a certain part or separate thing, but says that it extends in common to all beings, and that it investigates the principles of all things and contemplates these in their genera by the most simple intuitions in the same manner as the sight seizes the thing seen. Moreover, he adds that it comprehends universally the reasons or productive principles of all things, and with reference to this end it speculates and reasons discursively. Hence, that science alone is not based on an hypothesis, because it discovers the principles of all beings and is able to give the reasons for its own characteristic principles. Rightly, therefore, was this mode of exhortation constituted. For if we are unable to apprehend by a reasoning process of such a wisdom either what is more universal or perfect or common or self-sufficient or good or beautiful, certainly this app apprehension should be sought by those who wish to acquire felicity through reason and intellect. Lastly, the exhortation ascends to that which is highest as follows. Whoever is able to reduce all the genera under one and the same principle, and again to gather up and reckon them together, appears to me to be the wisest of men and to possess the most perfect veracity. He will also have discovered a beautiful place of survey from which he will be able to behold divinity and all things which are in coordination with and successive to him, subsisting separately or distinct from each other. Having likewise entered this most ample road, being impelled in a right direction by intellect, and having arrived at the end of his course, he will have conjoined beginnings with ends, and will know that God is the beginning, middle, and end of all things which are accomplished according to justice and right reason. Here he posits the end or purpose of the theological exhortation quite clearly. He considers that it does not involve numerous principles and all the genera of being. Rather, he argues vigorously that all the genera which are contained under one and the same principle should be analysed, and those enumerated natures which are nearest to the one principle should be separated from it. Thus, continuing to contemplate ever more distant and separate natures with the composite formed of the many and the one he composes and reckons together the multitude of things according to the reason principle, logos, of numbers. Proceeding in this fashion to each part, he at one time recalls himself from the multitude to the one, and at other descends from the one to the multitude. But since we specially desire truth and wisdom, the exhortation leads to such a knowledge of the one, all those who are truly versed in the theoretic science, and this is the end or summit of all contemplation. And he introduces the good, which is even more excellent than this, from which, as from a watchtower, we are able to behold divinity and all things which are in coordination with it. For if divinity is the author and basis of all truth, felicity, essence, cause and principle, we should certainly work ardently to acquire that science by which one will be able to behold the deity pure and through which he will find the broad or true road leading to him and through which he will conjoin ends with beginnings. For of such a kind is the most perfect life and felicity which perceives by no longer separating the ends from the first beginnings but collecting each of these into one containing simultaneously the beginnings, middle and end. For such is the nature of the divine cause, which it is necessary for those to adhere to who desire to reach the state of felicity. Thus, therefore, the exhortation considers all the things which are in us and in nature, and, so to speak, through all beings, and finally sums up or reduces all the modes of exhortation into one, namely that which leads to the divinity.